What in the hell is going on, guys? Welcome back to the Ranton Review Pro Wrestling. A shocker. An absolute shocker in Chicago. Windy City Riot, New Japan Pro Wrestling, Friday, April the 12th. We are going to look at this show. Um, I'm extremely... <laughs> I don't know what to say. I did not see that coming from a mile away. Before we get to that, you guys know the drill. It is YouTube. That's got, it's got that like button, it's got the subscribe button, it's got that notification bell. Make sure you hit all three of those down there if you enjoy content like this and enjoy coverage of the ever-changing landscape of New Japan Pro Wrestling. My goodness. So, let's get to the car proper. We first start off with Ren Narita. This will be very important later on in the show. Ren Narita taking on Minoru Suzuki in a long overdue match because Narita used to be part of of strong style for a very brief period of time where Minoru Suzuki took him under his wing uh, after coming back from excursion and Ren Narita kind of at that time being a Shibata clone. Well, he is far from that now. Uh, Suzuki beat the living crap out of him for a lot of this match, but Ren Narita was able to get the win by cheating and using the double cross, pinning Minoru Suzuki a huge win for Ren Narita. And like I said, that will have ramifications later in the show. Uh, we had the uh, strong women's championship match, AZM challenging Stephanie Vacker. And I think the women's matches in New Japan, uh, they, there's a tinge, they're, they're kind of trying to draw in from stardom a lot. They're trying to draw in from a lot of other women's promotions. The New Japan women's roster isn't quite um is solidified as a lot of those other promotions but this was a fun match it was only about 10 minutes long well only but it's, all, it's 10 minutes long uh stephanie did uh, retain the championship but she immediately had a new challenger uh come up right after the match as alex windsor throws her hat in the ring so that will probably be on the next uh new japan strong show i kind of like and by the way i'm kind of digging the fact that the new japan strong shows are just now uh, the pay-per-views that uh, the New Japan roster are doing over in the States. Um, I do, I do kind of miss the weekly show. I didn't watch it every single week, but I did watch it enough to kind of get familiar with a lot of those wrestlers. Some of those guys would be featured on this show. In fact, including in the next match as it was the strong tag team championship fatal four way, the champions, El Fantasma and Hikaleu, who issued the challenge which was kind of a numbskull thing to do uh, against anybody who could possibly p take up this sp the other three spots. They were immediately accepted by TMDK, Mikey Nichols, and Shane Haste. Later on, Fred Rosser, he called out his former rival in New Japan Strong when it was a weekly show, and Tom Lawler. And But Tom Lawler's charges, who were a support part of Team Filthy, uh, Joel Nelson and Roy Royce Isaacs, who are known as the West Coast Wrecking Crew, or the late which is a name that's been used by a lot of tag teams in history, but they are the current version of West Coast Wrecking Crew. I'm going to tell you something about this match. West Coast Wrecking Crew, I I saw them back in about a year ago when I was, well, not even that long ago, when I was watching Strong before. They always kind of impressed me. I always thought there was something there with them. They showed out in this match. If there was any team of the four that really stood out in this match, it was definitely them. They had a combo later on in a match that really got the crowd's appreciation and the post-match got their appreciation as well, but they didn't win the match. It was Shane Haste and Mikey Nichols sneaking a win after Phantasma and Hikaleu basically had the match won. Shane Haste comes in, throws Phantasma out, gets the three count, and they are now your new strong tag team champions. After the match, Nelson and Isaacs wind up brutally dropping Fred Rosser on his head on the outside of the ring on very, very thin mats. They have very little protection on the floor. It just felt like a old NWA 1980s show with, you know, the floor, the outside ring floor is mostly concrete. Tom Lawler also got the beat down too. So team filthy is pretty much done at this point, but a lot of moving on in the tag division here right now. So I'm going to be curious to see how that goes. I want to see a lot more of the West coast wrecking crew. I think, what I saw from them here was a lot better than what I saw from them a little bit, maybe a year ago or so. And I think they're coming along quite well as they're going to be one of the better tag teams in the next decade in pro wrestling in general. In a match that I think a lot of people were looking forward to at the show, Shota Umino took on the scapegoat, Jack Perry, in Chicago. 6,000 people at this show. A lot of them from Chicago. A lot of them really, really hating Jack Perry. And for the first time... See, 
we got to talk a little AEW here because, of course, the past week they had the ill-conceived, and I said, I think a lot of people said it beforehand, like, this is not a, probably not a good idea to release this footage. It turned out not to be a good idea. It's like probably 70 to 30 people thinking that this was an embarrassment for AEW. Of course, there's the people who go way over the extremes. Oh, AEW's done. It needs to shut its doors and all this kind of crap. Because, you know, the internet... I suggest to you guys, by the way, I know I'm I'm part of the IWC. I'm an internet... I'm a person who talks about wrestling on the internet and on social media. But I, at this point, guys, I probably would just ignore a lot of that shit. Just watch the shows. There was somebody who's... Uh, I follow on Twitter who said that their internet went out during some show they were watching and it was a different experience yes exactly if you don't pay attention to a lot of the expose crap that goes on on social media whatever but in this case i think it all actually wound up benefiting jack perry because any if you saw this match you saw his entrance him coming out with the swat team and all of this stuff to kind of protect him while he was in chicago and then he comes out and he turns his back he's got the chicago flag over him over his shoulders and then when he drops a chicago flag he turns his back to the camera and it, on on the back of his jacket it says cry me a river ah oh, that was great that was great jack perry i don't i mean yeah the the releasing the footage did not do any favors for anybody except for probably jack perry that guy is white hot right now and if this chicago new japan crowd was any indication of how hot he is Imagine him when he returns to AEW, which may be sooner than later, given the results of this match. But him and Shooter, this has been a long-standing rivalry since Jack Perry came into New Japan Pro Wrestling. He's been part of the House of Torture. The House of Torture has been a thorn in show to side for a number of months now. This is a really good match, by the way. Uh, and I, I said it uh, last week, Jack Perry is... He's gotten a lot better in the ring, like crisper in the ring. I shouldn't say better. He's, he was always good, but he's a lot crisper. And now he's really, he's really sinking his teeth in to being a heel and just living it up. He went for the go to sleep at one time during this match. <laughs> and people were driving, people were going nuts, man. He knows what, man. I think in a roundabout way, this might have been the best thing to happen for Jack Perry's career. It's too early to say, but if this is any indication, it might wind up, this whole CM Punk thing might wind up benefiting Jack Perry more than anybody else involved with it. Shota, however, got the win here with the Death Rider. Again, this will play into later in the show. Uh, big win over Jack Perry. I thought Jack Perry would win this match, but he lost and... Uh, I don't know if this is the end of his run in, in New Japan. A lot of people suspect that Jack Perry is going to be brought back to AEW at Dynasty, especially to help the Young Bucks against FTR, but time will tell on that one. But if it is, this is a short four, four or five month excursion for Jack Perry. I think he did a great job with his time in New Japan for what he was there to do. We had a special match, singles match, Mustafa Ali taking on Hiromu Takahashi. Both of these guys have been champions or were champions at one time. Hiromu is no longer the junior champion. Uh, Ali's got two titles. He's a T and he's a T and uh, a, I think we're calling it TNA again. He's a TNA champion, uh, X division champion. Uh, anyway, this is a long awaited match. This is a match. A lot of people wanted to see. I really was looking forward to it. It wasn't the kind of match that I thought because we got the return. Well, not the return, but we, yeah, we got the return of Daryl's family as Daryl jr. Apparently has been juicing. Hiromu brought back. A muscled up Daryl stuffed cat. We haven't seen Daryl in a long time. Daryl, for those of you who weren't around a couple years ago in New Japan, uh, <laughs> Hiromu used to bring a stuffed cat called Daryl. Uh, and he had another one called Carol because he it was obvious, clearly he was a fan of The Walking Dead. So he had his Daryl cat. And at some point, I think it must have been six or seven years ago, it, it was like the gimmick that he had that made him kind of stand out. And then Bad Luck Fale ripped the damn cat up during one of the G1 tours. And it's been a sad thing ever since then. But this is Daryl Jr. apparently. And they did a lot of skits with Daryl Jr. Normally, stuff like this would make me cringe. But with Hiromu, and again, it's, it's kind of like you got to be a character that's like tuned to this. Like... R-Truth can do silly stuff like this and it can get away with it because it's R-Truth. Toriano can do silly stuff and get away with it because it's Toriano. Hiromu can do stuff like this in a match and it not be cringe because it's Hiromu and we all know he's nuts. And Mustafa Ali kept telling him he was nuts. Uh, Mustafa Ali here back in front of his hometown crowd in Chicago. 
uh, didn't quite have the entire crowd. A lot of the crowd was for Hiromu. Uh, between all the silliness, there actually was a really good wrestling match in here. Ali winds up accidentally busting his head open when he did a uh, tope outside of the ring. Hit Hiromu. Everybody crashed into the barricade and they even knocked Chris Charlton out of his seat. Chris Charlton got, got JR'd. Uh, if you remember JR from uh, one of the old uh, shows back in the day, one of the old New Japan shows back in the day when Jay White threw Juice Robinson in the barricade and they knocked Jim Ross out of the damn chair. Josh Barnett almost killed Jay White over it. But uh, that it wasn't quite that serious in this one. But Mustafa Ali, I got to tell you, man, the dude was always crisp. And seeing him in a New Japan ring, he looks like he belongs there. And he looked like he was actually running laps around Hiromu, which is surprising. Uh, gets the win, Mustafa Ali. Uh, big time. I, I, he was one of the names I thought might be in Best of the Super Juniors, but I think Ali's got other plans in mind uh, for his career going forward. And Hiromu wants another match with him. Hopefully next time Hiromu's a little bit serious. LIJ kind of was goofing off a little bit too much on this night for my opinion the next match this next match confused me because i was under the impression i don't know why maybe i didn't read the whole thing but i was under the impression that this was a match for eddie kingston's new japan strong championship against gabe kid and i saw the press conference where they were talking about against each other and then somehow this wound up being a tornado tag match where they had three mystery partners so Gabe Kidd came out with David Finley, Clark Connors, and not Driller Maloney. I'm not sure why Driller was there. I'm a little concerned about what's going on with Driller Maloney because he did walk off as Sakura Genesis after the match in a huff. And I'm not sure what's going on with him there. And he wasn't at this show. He was replaced, but he was uh, subbed in by Kenta. So kind of getting worried for the War Dogs, man. The war, they were, I mean, we might be two down on the War Dogs. Alex Coughlin retired. Uh, due to to due to his body not being able to hold up because he's been injured too much, and now we got no driller. Where's driller? You know what, what's going on? But Kenta was a good substitute, I guess. Uh, they were taking on Eddie Kingston's team, and he chose two members of the United Empire who are the current who have are bitter rivals with the Bullet Club War Dogs, TJP and Jeff Cobb. But he also had freaking homicide. Homicide. That was a big shock. And this match was a brawl. The first part of this brawl was a little weird because, again, the problem with the New Japan Strong shows is that the production is, is still kind of, they're still doing quote-unquote indie production for this. So a lot of this fighting outside of the ring was done in the dark, so you couldn't see what was going on. They have to kind of invest, look, got to invest some money. If you're going to do a show in front of 6,000 people, I don't know, borrow Tony Khan stuff or whatever. You got to have some production. You got to have more lights, more lights, better lighting, better cameras anyway. But the last half of the match was bat crazy. And uh, it did wind up with all of the United Empire guys being laid out. Eddie Kingston wound up being choked by a chain and held in the corner by everybody else. Finley, Kenta and Clark Connors while Gabe Kidd hit the drill a hole pile driver on homicide and got the win. It's very curious here on the heel side. They, I, look, we were been saying it for a long time. The seeds are being planted for Gabe Kidd to take over Bullet Club. And here, this is Gabe Kidd's match, and he's using David Finley, who's supposed to be the leader, as kind of his second. And there's, there's there might be something going on there. I think this is going to play out over time. Uh, the seeds are being planted for probably New Year Dash next year for some sort of blow up between this. But Gabe Kidd and David Finley are going to be battling over Bullet Club or whatever's left of the War Dogs. God knows what's going on. I got to look up if, if anybody knows what's going on with Driller is if he just couldn't get a visa to come over to the States or if he's in hot water or he's injured or I know he, he was dealing with an arm injury, but I'm not sure. So we'll see what what's goes on with um, the War Dogs in the future. But Gabe K getting the win after the match. They continue brawling. Eddie Curson, Eddie or Eddie Cursing, yes, Eddie Cursing Kingston dropped a bunch of f bombs as he then proceeded to challenge Gabe Kidd at the next New Japan Strong Show in the States to a no ropes last man standing match. I'm assuming that's going to be for the Strong Title. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see in the future. Gabe Kidd was angry. The brawl continued. Uh, those two, I, I, I'm assuming from the backstory between the two of them, because apparently Gabe Kidd had some, 
some uh, personal health issues or mental health issues. And Eddie Kingston, as we all know, he's had his and he kind of worked and helped Gabe Kidd through it. So I think this is a few because these guys kind of bonded over that in real life. So we'll see what happens in the future. Seventh match for the TV championship. I loved this match. Matt Riddle defending the championship against former champion, the first ever NJPW Strong TV champion, Zack Sabre Jr., the best technical wrestler in the world, the Tekker himself. This match, I love TV title matches. I loved them when I was a kid. When I was a kid, the NWA had TV title matches all the time. They were the same thing, 15-minute time limit. It put this kind of urgency in the matches, and you saw that in this match. Matt Riddle was booed by about half of the crowd. Zack Sabre Jr. seemed to be over with most of the crowd. At one point, Zack is not doing finger manipulation and snapping fingers. He's snapping Matt Riddle's toes, which was brilliant and amazing and awesome. This match was high speed, technical wrestling, Matt wrestling. It was really Zack style against Matt Riddle trying to strike and trying to hit one big strike. But, he, you know, Matt Riddle's a former UFC fighter, obviously, so he knows how to, you know, he, he can go on the mat. Uh, I thought there'd be a little bit more of that in this match, but Riddle seems to be completely converted over to a pro wrestler, but not a former MMA fighter who is playing at play pro wrestler, if you get what I'm saying. Zach, with only two minutes to go, I think, in the match, managed to eke out the win with the crucifix. Sneaky win here, but it came down to the mat wrestling, as it always does with Zach Sabre Jr. getting the win over Matt Riddle, which, I, I, again, Matt Riddle, I think he's done well in his role uh, outside of WWE, wrestling on the local scene, wrestling in New Japan. I think it's pretty cool that uh, Zach Sabre Jr. is once again the champion. His championship, the championship he made famous, and the first challenger he's getting out of the shoot is... Jeff Cobb. Those two had a fantastic series last year over that TV championship. And here, the weird thing about this too, again, going back to the old NWA, you know, the two of them were always reminded me, which is probably why I like this, is of the old series of TV title matches in the NWA that Mike Rotundo, who would be playing the Zack Sabre Jr. role here, he was the TV champion, and he had a challenger who was a big, burly guy and Dr. Death Steve Williams, who in this case will be played by Jeff Cobb. The dynamic is almost exactly the same. Uh, so that, and I love those matches back then, and I'm loving the matches that Matt, uh, that Matt, that Zach and Jeff Cobb have had recently in the last couple of years for the TV title. If we're going back to that rivalry, it's one of some of the best matches, some of the most underrated matches that New Japan had a couple of years ago. So I'm looking forward to them renewing that rivalry. Semi main event. A special challenge match, again, this one I thought was for the championship, it wasn't, but the IWGP Global Champion, Nick Nemeth, formerly known as Dolph Ziggler, took on Tomohiro Ishii. The story of this match is that Ziggler Nemeth wanted to test himself against true, proper Japanese strong style wrestlers, and you don't get any more so than that than Tomohiro Ishii. Ishii, of course, rarely wins a match. That guy loses more matches, but still remains a threat despite the fact that he's got a very bad win-loss record. But Ishii is awesome, and you're, you're going to get a great match out of Ishii. This match was fantastic. Nick Nemeth's style does work in New Japan. That is what I came away from this match with, is that he can still wrestle his style, but with a little bit more heart, a little bit more fire, a little bit more toughness. And that's kind of the thing when you get... And the, the commentary, English commentary was talking about this, the difference between wrestling as an artist and wrestling as a science. The difference between wrestling like uh, Tomohiro Ishii, who's a brawler, and a guy who's more like a showman, like Nick Nemeth. Uh, the showman did win out on his night, but the showman had to get tough to do it. He does wind up hitting the danger zone on Tomohiro Ishii to get the win. Ishii hit his own Ishii zone earlier in the match to show that he, he's familiar with who Nick Nemeth is. This is a great match, too. I definitely re The last three matches on this card, I recommend them. Uh, but Nemeth th did get the win here. Um, he still wants to prove himself. I, apparently, he still wants to. Get, he still wants the president. He still wants Tanahashi. Uh, and I, I assume at some point David Finley is going to be try to come back for this title. They haven't had a rematch as I'm aware of yet. So uh, the future is still going for Nick Nemeth in New Japan. I would like to see him on more Japanese New Japan shows. I don't know if his schedule allows that, but uh, we are running into a bit of an issue that with the champions that I'm going to talk about at the end of this video. The main event. One I've been looking forward to for a while, ever since uh, the match was announced, is Tetsuya Naito defending the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship against John Moxley. And Mox, I did not realize this, 
by winning this match, Mox would become the only person to be an AEW, WWE, and IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. Basically, he'd be the first Triple Crown Champion of this new era of wrestling. You know, we've had it in the past where it was the WWF, the AWA, and the NWA. Then at one point it was ECW, WCW, WWE. And nowadays, the three big, as I always say, that's why I cover them, are New Japan, AEW, and WWE, obviously. So, Box has got a goal here. He's, But he's not doing it. So He's doing it for the goal, but he's also doing it because he feels he's underappreciated in wrestling. I would agree with that. Um, but this puts his name in the history books. And Tetsuya Naito came into this match not a, not a, less than a week from that tremendous match he had with Yoda Suji last year, uh, last week at Sakura Genesis, defending the title. And uh, Naito ran into the third title defense bug that he's been played with his entire career. This is the third defense of the championship. And unfortunately for him, he lost. Mox was bleeding, of course, because it's Mox. I uh, took a nasty shot with a chair in the middle of the match, which is pretty cool. Uh, this match, again, as I thought, it was going to be a banger. A lot of close calls in this one. But as I said, John Moxley, after a couple of Death Riders, became the new IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. An absolute shock. An AEW contract, a non-contracted New Japan wrestler is now the IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. So I guess folks like myself who keep telling New Japan to stop putting their championships on guys who are not contracted to the company. <laughs> I think we're, they're doing it again now with the championship. Although with John Moxley, I think it's a safe. I mean, Mox is not going in. He's not pulling at Carl Anderson. So I don't think they have to worry about that too much with him. After the match, uh, Mox, who seemed pretty emotional after the match, he decided that his first defense is going to be against Shota Umino as the, the graduation ceremony for Shota Umino, old shooter, but it was Ren Narita, like I said, this would come back. Ren Narita, after getting a big win over Minoru Suzuki, of all people, at the beginning of the night, attacked John Moxley after the match. Mox was uh, getting his butt kicked until Shooter came out and saved him. And Mox jokingly said, hey, thanks, man. <laughs> and then, uh, to probably the line of the night, he's, he told Ren Narita, he's like, you know what? You've just, you're about to go from a young boy to a dead man. And that, <laughs> that, was, that was a great way to end the show. So yeah, shock among shocks. John Moxley is now your IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. There's not going to be an immediate rematch for Naito. I don't know what this does with Naito. Um, Lij played around too much on this show, and uh, we now have John Moxley, an AEW wrestler, as the IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. We have Nick Nemeth, who's not really in New Japan. He's kind of a guest, I guess. In New Japan, not on a contract. He's there's your because the global title, I guess, is the secondary championship now. So Nick Nemeth is that champion. The TV championship is held by Zack Sabre Jr., who's a foreigner, but at least he's under contract. And we do have the never open weight champion who is Shingo Takagi. Oh, there is a Japanese wrestler holding a championship in New Japan Pro Wrestling, but he's holding probably the third or fourth highest championship in the company. Uh, and if you look at the rest of it, yeah, the 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 tag team the junior tag team champions are foreigners the uh, the strong tag team champions are foreigners the strong world champion is eddie kingston who's under contract with aew who else do we have any other japanese wrestlers who have championships in new japan pro wrestling we got bishimon as the tag champions and we got show as the junior heavyweight champion well uh, uh, as somebody I know and respect on, on YouTube says, New Japan is a Western wrestling company. <laughs> they pretty much are now. All the, like, the majority of championships are held by people who are either not in a company or are not Japanese. So take that for what you will. But overall, as far as the show is concerned, I thought this was a really, really good show. Uh, this was a great palate cleanser from the craziness that's been going on in the other Western wrestling, the other two big wrestling, Western wrestling companies. Uh, but they were all able to feed off of it because the interesting thing about New Japan Strong Shows is kind of this convergence of a lot of different places. You get some Ring of Honor people. We have some stardom people. We have guys like Mustafa Ali and Nick Nemeth and Matt Riddle who are synonymous and most famous for being in WWE. You got guys like Jack Perry who's, who's most famous for being in AEW as, as well as John Moxley and Eddie Kingston. So you got this mashup in these New Japan Strong pay-per-views now of 
a cross section of a lot of the major wrestling companies and you get to see them on one show. I think it's really cool and the matches are all excellent and my recommendation, I, I would recommend the whole show, but in particular, the last three matches, Naito and Mosley, uh, Nemeth and Ishii and Matt Riddle and Zack Sabre Jr. were absolutely excellent. Definitely suggest you guys checking those those matches out. Uh, Ali and, and, and uh, Takahashi, if you can accept the, uh, the the silliness of Takahashi, that was a good match. And Shota Umino and Jack Perry was a good match. And you just have to see Jack Perry in front of 6,000 people in Chicago. It's just a sight to behold. And like I said, I think this thing, as bad as it may seem and as stinky as it may feel right now, if this is where they're going with Jack Perry, it might actually be a big boom for Jack Perry. Uh, I think he may have turned the corner and gone from being a pillar and a potential future star. I think he's there. Um, and I'm just curious to see what he's going to do over the next couple of months. But that's what I think. Let me know what you guys think. Let your voice be heard in the comment box below. Um, I also have some other videos. I have some other channels. I don't talk about them too much sometimes on the show. I keep forgetting to. But over on the gaming channel, we just wrapped up our Let's Play of Metal Gear Solid 2, the new HD edition that they released a couple months ago. So you can go check that out on Rant and Review Gaming. And uh, yeah, until next time, I'll see you guys here for more news, rumors, and commentary on the Rant and Review Pro Wrestling. Have a good day.